Okay, hi everyone. So I'm Jason here. I used to work as an auditor in a big accounting firm. And an auditor is just a data analyst in a different field. And I thought I knew everything about personal data until I start to involve myself in personal data research. And that's when I knew that I actually do not know a lot about personal data. So let me give you an example. So all of us here in Malaysia, we drink bubble tea. You walk into a bubble tea shop and after you buy, then the cashier will ask you, would you like to join our loyalty program? You buy, buy 10, you get one free bubble tea drink. Most of the time, we will just register ourselves. So we give our full name, our address, our IC number, our mobile phone number, blah, blah, blah. And then we'll start to get that stamp. So once we get 10 stamps, we'll get one free bubble tea. So at this point of time, most of us, we will think about what's the harm in that? Everyone knows my full name anyway. Everyone knows my IC number. It's public information. It's harmless. What can they do about it after all? So here are the two things that they can do. With your home address, they can find out whether they should open a shop near your house. For all of us, that is a good thing. We don't need to travel so far. With our date of birth, they can give us vouchers. So like, oh, on birthday, come over to my place. You can probably get a free bubble tea drink. And probably you'll be tempted to also buy more. For some people, this is good. But for people who cannot control their own spending, this is bad. So we can see that when we give away our personal data, they can analyze it, generate some knowledge out of it, and take some action. Some of these actions that they take are good for us. And some of the actions that they take can be bad for us. So just now what the MC said that I used to be a total privacy geek because I was always focused on the negative externalities when I share my personal data. But when I look into personal data, personal data is also beneficial for me also. So let me give some examples. So just now we talk about our name, surname, age. All these are what I found usually what we think about what personal data is. But these are just identifiers. What do you like? What memberships you are in? Which club you are in? You currently right now sitting on that chair in IMU is also a form of personal data. The next thing here, your career. How long have you been there? How is your performance there? Your pay slips. How much are you earning at this period of time to that period of time? That is also a personal data. The next thing about your body dimensions, your history, your payment history, your medical history. How, where were you? Which kindergarten were you in? Uh, your location data. All these are your personal data. Sometimes when, when I was... But before I started being involved in personal data, I used to think that personal data is just my name, my name, my address. But if you look into it, all of these are actually your personal data. How, how do we actually come about doing this? If you look in terms of the official definition of personal data given by the European Union, it says that Personal data is any information that is related to an identifiable living individual. So that means me speaking to you right now and walking across like this every few seconds is a behavior, my behavior. That is my personal data. So if someone is trying to impersonate me and he doesn't walk so often like me, you can know that this is not the real Jason. That you can see, right? the things of personal data. And with all that information that we had just now, a few slides ago, your payment history, your medical history, when I was sick, what do I do when I'm sick, what do I do when I have a fever, how often do I go to the toilet, all this, when all combined together in the digital world, what we can do in the personal data world is that I can create a digital twin of you. A digital twin of you is, would be exactly like you. 
And what we can do with a digital twin is that we can run simulations on it. If I poke Jason's left shoulder, what would Jason do? With all the data that I collected about Jason, the computer can say that probably Jason would flinch, right? That's what the computer can tell me because I have a digital twin of you. And what this shows is that a lot of us here have heard about Cambridge Analytica, right? So it's very common, everyone kind of in one way or the other heard about it. Cambridge Analytica has 5,000 data points of individuals. That means 5,000 different data about that guy. And because of that, what they can do is that they can run all these simulations, find out what will happen if I show this person a video, what will happen if I show a person this kind of picture, how would they react? And what Cambridge Analytica do for their clients is that they shape election outcomes. They actually change how we will react, how we think. If you look at the world today, you kind of feel like why everyone is becoming more hateful to another race or distrust another person. All these are because of the information that you receive on the internet, which has already been filtered through algorithms that are trained on your personal data. So in this way, for a person who has any intention, political intentions, that they want to control other people, all they need to do is to get a picture, to get hold of your digital twin, and they can start manipulating you. So, is this going to be a new form of slavery instead of by violence, but with the use of technology? A lot of people are getting worried about that. And three, two, three years ago, what happened in the European Union is that we need, they say that we need to do something about it. And as politicians, their mode is through regulations. And their regulations, they say that every individual should have eight rights. And these eight rights should be respected by companies. So what are the eight rights? So the eight rights are on the board. I'm going to just read them and just probably give a little bit of illustration. The first one is the right to be informed. So when sometimes when you all fill up an application form, they will say that, would you like, uh, would you agree that we will use your personal data for marketing purposes? That is your first right they must tell you what are they going to do with your personal data. The next thing is the right of access. Here, we, you don't really see it happening here in Malaysia, but in the Europe, you can write an email to any company out there and say that, I want to know all the information that you have of me, and you, they must revert back to you in two weeks. They probably will give you a zip file or they will probably send you a CD of all the information that they have on you. That is your right. The next is the right to rectification. What here means that if that person has my date of birth wrong, I can tell that company or entity to say that, hey, that's not my birth date, please change it. Next is the right to restrict processing. So if you do not want that particular entity to use your personal data, to send marketing materials to you, you can say so, and they cannot do that. Right to data portability, this means that you have the right to say that I want my information to be given to me in a zip file, so they can't send it to you in a hard copy. Right to object, that's obvious. A right in relation to automated decision and profiling. And the right to erasure, you can tell them that to erase your personal data. That are the eight rights given by GDPR. In Malaysia, there's PDPA. The rights are similar in nature, but you actually don't have the last four. You don't have the last four rights in Malaysia. So it means that you cannot go and tell um, probably tea leaf, for example, to erase your data. They have no obligation to do that. So what? So when GDPR happened two years ago, and all companies that engage in an economic activity in Europe have to comply with that, what happens is that every entity has to start placing attention to how they manage other people's personal data. 
And the intention is that when they place attention on it, they will hope that at least our personal data will be more secure. But what happens instead? In 2018 and 2019 is the history's most occurrence of data breaches ever. And this happens after GDPR has been regular, has been established. So here are a few examples that I take out from Google two days ago. So you can see that uh, first one, in the first six months of 2019, there are 4.1 billion records has been breached. Cathay Pacific breached there, 1 billion records in Adha, that's in India. Marriott has to pay 126 million because 900 million of their customers' data and payment data has been stolen by hackers. See, all these are keep happening. And we start to think, why are they not improving their cybersecurity? Actually, all of these companies have been trying very, very hard to improve their cybersecurity. But these things still happen because, as some proverbs says before, there will always be a smarter person than you. So in this case, the hackers are smarter than the data security people. So what happened is that eight years ago, seven UK universities professors got together and started to research about personal data. And what they found out was there is a serious problem in how we approach data systems. And it all boils down to one simple question. Do corporates and entities really need to hold personal data? We don't usually question that because every time we build an application as developers in the hall, we will know that we will definitely need to get the user to register an account, give us their full name so we know how to identify them, to get their email, their password, so we can you know, send them vouchers and all that. And then we must store this data somewhere in our server. This is something that is no longer questioned anymore. It's become so template that you can actually copy paste from GitHub somewhere. So we question this, do companies actually need to do that? If you think about it, when you register yourself at a bank, the bank has verified you, and from then on, what happens to you? You become customer 12345. They no longer address you by name anymore. You become customer 12345 on their system. So that shows that they don't really care about your personal data unless they want to show that they are human. And you can see all the banks in the world, like Maybank, humanizing financial services. And through that research, we found a few things that will actually get to see data in a new way. The first thing is that data is actually co-produced. No one produces data by themselves. You see, right now, what happens is that companies, they tend to think that, oh, I collected this data. This data belongs to me right now. No, that's not true because if I do not have a service with you or if I did not interact with you, there is no way that data can be generated. That data generated belongs to both the individual and the company. The next thing is that using any form of data does not prevent anyone else from using it. So if I have a copy of my data and you have a copy of my data, when I use it, it does not stop you from using it. That is very different from me holding this mic. When I'm using this mic, no one else can use it. But that is not true with data. This is a unique thing about data. The next thing is that data can be duplicated infinitely. So I like this phone, uh, this mi microphone again. There is only this microphone in this world. But data can be copy pasted anywhere means that theoretically that data can be infinitely duplicated. The next thing is that data has a diminishing store of value. Yes, we hear a lot that data is the new oil, but we should not forget that unlike oil, oil is useful forever because they don't decompose. But data do decompose in a way. Let's say, for example, like if you get a personal data of me right now that I like chocolate 20 years ago, does that mean that I like chocolate right now? Most, most probably yes, because it's chocolate, but some people can just go and say that, no, I don't want to eat chocolates anymore, right? Data has diminishing store of value. It gets more and more useless over time. 
The next thing is that the only way to prevent others from using data is actually via a legal or technological framework. We have a legal framework in terms of GDPR, but we don't have a technological solution. The next thing is that the data can actually be treated as a currency. How does this work? When I, for example, I'm having a birthday coming on and you want to buy me a birthday gift. If I don't tell you anything, how would you know what to buy for me? I need to tell you something about myself, right? So I said, I like chocolates. So when I give you that personal data information of me, you can now go like, ah, I should buy Jason a chocolate. So in a way, data has been used as a currency. I told you what I like and I got the chocolate back. I paid the chocolate with my personal data. And here, there needs to be a trust anchor when it comes to managing data transactions because right now we don't know who to trust, right? So with all this in mind, our research from eight years ago, we started to develop a technology called the hub of all things technology. And the hub of all things technology encompasses all these research findings that we get into this kind of format. If you look at the world today, every application that we all download right now requires us to register a user account. So if I have 100 apps, I have 100 user accounts, 100 usernames and passwords, and I'll probably forget 75% of them. And what we do here is that with, with our technology here that we develop, we give each and every person a personal data microserver. This is what we talked about earlier that there needs to be a legal framework because data can be duplicated infinitely. You cannot have ownership on data, but there can only be one database and any data within the database belongs to the owner of the database. So hence in that way, when you have your own database with all your data inside, you own it and then you can start sharing with other people. And with that concept in mind, this is what we would seek to achieve, which is what all of us would want also, that whenever we share our data with other people, we want them to give some benefit back to us, but not to use it to manipulate us for their own ends. And that is what I think about why, what happens to me when I turn from a total data privacy geek into a data mobility advocate. Because when we start sharing things that we have, or we start respecting rights in terms of property rights, that's when total prosperity will increase. Just look back into history. In the beginning, no one owns anything. We just go into the forest and pluck some berries and then we just say that this is mine. But who owns that tree? No one owns that tree. But when we start to recognize farms, this farm belonged to Jason. Then no one will start you know, stealing from Jason. Then everyone will start to increase their productivity. Total prosperity will increase. This is what we expect when we give each and every person intellectual property rights to their own personal data. When you have your own rights to your own personal data, you can expect that your total prosperity will increase just as much as you have physical property rights. Thank you.